Kia ora, mai, haere mai, and welcome to another Aotearoa Rugby Pod after one of the most talked about test matches in quite a while. The Springboks, aerial balls left, right and centre. The All Blacks can't hold on to the ball at all. It was not a good game if you're after running rugby. Joining me now to have a look at this game and the other game, of course, Australia versus Argentina. James Parsons in Auckland, Bryn Hall down in Christchurch. And boys, let's start with you, Bryn. That, about that game. <laughs> <laughs> did you enjoy it? I did, and I so I can sense your frustration, Ross, and probably the most uh, the country, to be honest, with what you know the spectacle that the South Africans put on. But look, you know, I, I, I commend them around the way they wanted to play. They were, you know, they talked around implementing a game plan that they want to do. And look, when you get the result, to be honest, if Geordie Barrett doesn't kick that kick, you know, we're probably in a different situation around um, talking around how well the South Africans' plan worked because look. They kicked a lot more. They had 38 kicks. Um, they nullified our set piece, especially in line out. Got a lot of te- a lot of steals, especially in that first half. You know, they had three we had three opportunities in that first half, and due to the line out pressure of um, the South Africans getting that ball and Khaleesi, especially in that first one, first opportunity we had in that first half, countering counter rucking through and really putting us under pressure, kind of setting the tone to be honest for the South Africans. And look, you know, they, they kicked really well. Again, um, they implemented a, a few different structures around their kick plans. I think in the first half, they kicked to the middle of the field, even inside uh, the attacking zone. And, you know, I actually saw in that first kick with George Bridge when he unfortunately dropped their ball. It was a set play with Mopepe. He was right next to Fafta Klerk in the midfield. And they were looking to get into that space because like we talked about um, last week in the last couple of uh, podcasts around the middle of the field and that stick space and the pendulum. And they really saw that as a plan. And even though Fafta Klerk's kicked it and wasn't executed really well, um, George Bridge drops that, and then Nokosi, Nokosi scores off that. So, look, they they kicked 38 times. Uh, they nullified our set piece, especially at line out and with a few scrum pedals and throughout the game. And um, and look, they didn't run it a lot, but look, um, they did what they wanted, and they got the points that they deserved um, when they were down there. So, look, I know the Kiwi public would be a little bit frustrated, and Jim will probably allude to a little bit more around the game. But look, I thought the way that they wanted to implement the game, they did what they wanted. They put us under a lot of pressure through set-piece parity, and especially with that, that rush defence, which we'll probably address a little bit more going into um, the a bit more detail around it. But look, South Africans did what they wanted to do, and look, they could have got the result if Jordy Barrett doesn't nail a 77-minute uh, goal kick in the end. Yeah, look, I, I, I think I enjoyed it from the sense of how tight it was. I think that created a lot of... Um, I suppose, energy and excitement in our household because uh, you weren't too sure if we're going to get this result or not. Uh, but they, they, you know, we knew this game plan was coming. Uh, they've executed it really well in that Lions series. They uh, probably went away from that accurate execution uh, for a couple of weeks. And then we mentioned last week, Styles make fights and, and the Springboks really like uh, playing against the All Blacks and, and this, I suppose, stifling of tempo rugby style um, does does get them some good rewards. Um, yeah. You know, Bryn, you alluded to uh, loss of line-out. There was four lost line-outs out of, I think, Apostle 21, but those four were in attacking areas. And, and in past weeks, that's where we've been able to get our game going and, um, I suppose, score some points off the back of that. But just as well as set-piece, another real key area is the breakdown. And, and we spoke about it at length, um, and, and that we weren't going to have, have it all our way. Uh, against the Springboks, if we could keep up that um, physical dominance in and around that area and play fast tempo footy, then we know we'd uh, you know keep ourselves in this fixture. But because we probably lost more breakdowns than one, it didn't enable us to play on that front foot that we've been used to the last few weeks. So uh, that was a big factor. And I think that you know the, the set piece and the breakdown will be a key area. Uh, for the All Blacks to rectify going into this week. And, and I know numbers one to eight will be certainly rolling their sleeves up to make sure uh, they're better for it. And then obviously the error count. I don't think you'll see it again. You know, sometimes mm-hmm. you just have these games. George Bridge, one of the best exponents under the high ball, making errors. You know, you don't you don't see that two games in a row um, at all. And, and even some skill set errors. So used to seeing, you know, it was only a week ago or two weeks ago that we're talking about, um, you know, Jacobson's short ball to Rico and the skill set showing from 1 to 23. Uh, you don't lose that in a week. Um, it certainly wasn't um, the execution they would have liked. So, again, that sort of skill set under that line speed depressure, uh, they'll, they'll be looking at. But there's a couple of things they can take out of as well. I thought they made really good gains 
uh, when they were forced back in. Uh, Cody Taylor's try, he forced back in and, and made some inroads up the middle there as well. So there was enough good and bad, but as we know with the New Zealand public, they're quite critical. But let's all be honest, we, we won the test. And uh, mm. a lot of, the, uh, I suppose, the reviewing of it has been about the Springboks. But I, I think you've got to commend our our men for you know hanging in there, having the mental fortitude to work their way back into this game and, and, and sneak home with a victory. I suppose the hard part for me is more theoretical than actually, you know, when it comes to the winning, losing of games, yeah, you want to win ugly if, if you have to, you know, or, or whatever. But William Webb Ellis did not pick up a rugby ball and run with it so you could get incessant box kicking. Is it at the heart and soul of rugby as far as obviously Kiwis are concerned? That's the, I, this is a product you've got to sell. Uh, yeah, I think that's the problem. Like, no, and it's probably us Kiwis, probably it's a style that we're not used to. Like, look, we haven't played the South Africans in a couple of years and we've watched that British and Irish Lions series and it was a kick-a-thon and it was more so around field position, set-piece parity, and then obviously putting teams under pressure through the kicking game. So, look, I think it's we struggle as Kiwis to understand it, but I don't, I don't see it that way. I think... Look, if the South Africans, you look at the last two test matches against the Australians when they did play, they wanted to play a little bit more and through not executing really well under pressure and getting the points that they wanted to play in a lot, they went back and they even said in the, after that review they didn't want to implement what they wanted to do. And so they made it a real clear play and coming in, they went back to that 38, 38 kicks, which they did, which is the amount of number that they had against the Britain and Irish Lions and really put the skill set and defensive line speed pressure, which we saw on the weekend, even though they were tackling at 77%, the amount of times that the winger would get high and put the All Blacks skill, skill set under pressure due to that line speed that we saw in that Britain, British and Irish line series. So I know you talk about William Webb Ellis and his idea around running with the ball to score a try, but look, I think if they go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the All Blacks with the attacking brain and want to play rugby, I think they're going to fall second best. So moving forward to the to the 2023 World Cup, they might want to adapt and be able to play that brand to be able to play with rugby and play with the ball in hand to score points. But at this stage, I think that the plan that they have, they're going to implement. And even Khaleesi said after the game as well, this is the way we want to play. Even the only time that I did question it was possibly that 77th minute when Yanchis puts that box kick up. And it was really interesting to hear Khaleesi's message uh, after the game saying that, no, it was exactly what we're talking about on the field as players. We wanted to go through that. We really wanted to put the skill set under pressure. So it's going to be a clear plan moving forward, especially for next week. I don't think they'll tinker too much. Uh, but I think... But one good thing that Jacques uh, brought up as well, is, and it's probably good for our viewers to probably understand as well, is that what they're seeing in their attack shape is one-on-one -on -one opportunities. So whether that be one-on-one -on -one with the defender with ball in hand or it's a one-on-one -on -one in the air, they're taking that as a win to be able to get that 50-50 contest or beat that defender in attack. So you know when you've got a really good defensive line like the All Blacks have, whether that be 13 players or two in the back, and or there might be one time that there's 14 in the line, where's the space going to be? It's going to be a contestable kick like they did, whether that's off Fafta Klerk, Andre Pollard, and they've got a real opportunity to do that. They even did it inside the 22 or 30 metre zone. But you know, if that ball bobbles and goes backwards and there's two South Africans chasing it for that ball, that's a try. So I think the interpretation around what South African are seeing for an opportunity compared to what New Zealanders are seeing with, with the attack rugby running brand, um, it's a little bit different, so I think they won't change a lot out of it. I suppose putting a bomb up underneath the opposition sticks is a traditional rugby tool, isn't it? It's something that was used for years and years and maybe hasn't been as much recently because you fight hard to get that territory. Um, but Chipper, when it came to that 77th minute kick from Herschel Yankees and the chance maybe to take a drop goal, it seems very un-South African not to go for the drop goal as well. Yeah, well, I suppose they were, they were quite far out, so it would have been an ambitious ploy, I think, um, for a droppy. But even before that, they'd made some good bends on the edge uh, by putting the ball through um, the hands, as in the Springboks. I think Van Mullen ran down the right-hand side and uh, would have made 20, 25 metres uh, from them using the ball through their hands. So they do have the ability if the space is there to go there. And, and I, I look, I was surprised that they went to the box kick, and, and that's great that Sia says that's the plan. but in the end, that, that probably lost them the game. Um, and that's the reality of it is, is put, they put themselves in a position to win it. And I think there's still a balance. It's just like when we talk about uh, teams with a lot of flair with ball in hand, it's having the balance to play the tactical kicking game as well. Well, I think there just needs to be a little bit, you, you know, I think it was around the 47th minute when um, it's a good line-out ball off the top, quick ball, and Faf puts up a box kick, I think, on mm. the 22. Uh, and, and I'm not saying it's the wrong tactic. It's just it's just they've worked so hard to get down there 
they are quite um, good at being dominant um, in that 22 collision area. And as we know, Bryn, like when you get into the 22 metre, it's almost forwards roll their sleeves up to suck the defence and to build up an opportunity mm. for the back to expose. And, and that's when I thought they could have come into their own a little bit with their physical prowess, with their, you know, their latch carriers and, and getting marks and co uh, running over that game line rather than having one ruck and then kick. Yeah. Yeah, I, I agree. Because I think, look, we every time you play a South African team with, with, how, with how big they are and such big ball carriers, and especially when they want to latch, they've got a great ability to be able to get the guy behind, hold on to them and push them through contact. They do that really, really well in the South African team. So, look, I think possibly moving forward, they might want to keep continuing to have those uh, attacking kicks where they put box kicks off for Faf or Hondre Pollard to be able to get in that position around a, a contest or a 50-50 contest just outside the line. But... Yeah, I think that marrying up of being a see to see that opportunity, but then letting the forwards be able to exert a bit of pressure onto the All Blacks, you know, let them defend seven, eight, ten phases just for them being able to have those big ball carriers. Sometimes you can give it out to the backs to give them opportunity on the edge because, you know, the All Blacks gave away ten penalties, but they're just not stressing them enough defensively. So, um, as, as you know, Chip, when you're defending that high phase count, and even if you are a good, def- a good defensive team, you're either going to come through seven points or you're going to get three points due to the ill discipline of the defensive team. So, and then also as well, like Fafta Clerk, he's got some, a great grubber game in behind as well. You know, he scored in that British and Irish Lions series, whether it be off line out attack, just around the ruck. You know, and the last week he's, um, when they played Australia, went down the blind side early in that second half and puts a kick in behind. So I think it's like you said, it's marrying up those two things around the kick game. They're going to implement that if they do see the space, but just rolling their sleeves up and then asking the questions of All Blacks for that seven to eight, ten phases. So then, you know, you can't come up with a try, at least exerting a bit of energy of defensively from the All Blacks and asking them questions instead of just putting up a 50-50 contest in the air. Yeah, and I think they would have seen, um, you know, opportunities that RG sort of showed on the switch play. They've been very effective mm. on the switch play in the um, British and Irish lines. So I, I think they just shouldn't underestimate their ability to play that other style of footy or the traditional, um, you know, physical dominant uh, get over the game line style, but also... You know, they've got, they had um, Elton Yanchis on the bench for a reason as well. And I felt maybe he could have been um, a key part. You know, the Lions, uh, when they went on that great run and they're making home finals and um, were outstanding in Super Rugby, it was through a lot of flair and entertaining footy, as well as that physical dominance going to the corner. I think Malcolm Mark scored about 25 tries off the back of a mall. So they, they, have, they have the players there that can go between the two games. Uh, and I just, I just think they should utilise uh, it a little bit more, and not always just go for that, especially one phase. Right? It, yeah. Defending takes gas out of you, so the more you can make um, players defend, the more opportunity you may get later. It might not happen straight away there in that moment, but it saps energy and it might create an opportunity for you to expose later. Especially, especially if in that twenty-two jump or that kind yeah, of thirty meter zone. Because look, I think they're going to implement their game plan around suffocating with their with their box kicks to be able to get out of the half. You know, Larue, Pollard, they're going to kick to be able to get that field position. And then once they do get into that that twenty two or thirty meter attacking zone, rolling up their sleeves and holding on to their ball. Because look, like I agree with you, Jip. You know, if you do that ten to twelve phases, and you might not get that try there, but it might be a penalty or you might knock it on or whatever. The back end of the game, that last 10, 15 minutes, with having those consistent high phase counts early in the game, it's going to tire out the forwards. So. Yeah, it's going to be interesting to see if they do implement holding or holding on a little bit more because like, I know set piece-wise, if they have a line-out there, um, they're going to go for a line-out drive and line-out more to be able to exert pressure that way, which I thought the All Blacks actually defended really well. Um, we'll probably talk about that a little bit more. But yeah, I just think just throwing a little bit more and possibly Yanchi's coming on a little bit earlier, um, you might help with that running game um, at the back end of games. I wouldn't mind Bridges touching on the mastery of the box kick from, um, from Faf because... It appears he has so many more options than I think I've seen from any other halfback with his box kick. Like the one that went to George Bridge was almost half wipers kick, half box kick. You you can't know quite where he's going with it. Well, I think first and foremost, like his execution of his box kick is world class. And so what I mean around that, it's the distance that he's that he's kicking it at. So ideally in that first test match when he played the Australians or you let's use the Australian um, game for the first game as an example. He was kicking it a little bit too long. So he was kicking, whether it be just inside the 22 or just outside the 22, and he was kicking it towards halfway, which if it is, if it has the right height and it's a really good chase with no escorts, 
you know, Nakosi or no Mel Pepe will be able to get up to the ball. But with how teams are doing it now, and even thought the New Zealanders did pretty well around escorting you, it's really hard for those defenders to be able to jump up for the ball and contest for it. But in these kind of last two test matches, he's hit around that kind of just past the 10 metre line. So it's like a 19, 20 metre kick or 22 metre kick, which gives a little bit more time for Mopepe and Nokosi to get up for that ball. But I think what they are doing really well as well is that they've got an open side chaser as well, whether that be Itzebeth, who's he's done it a couple of times, or it might be Van Mullen. So as an escort player, ideally it's a, it's a, it's a halfback or the last forward on that edge. And so those two guys are usually going to be able to escort the Mopepe or the Nokosi. But on the guys on the open side, it's a lot easier because you don't see it coming. So you saw a couple of times Itzebeth or Van Mullen and Test Matches have been able to get up for that ball. First and foremost, due to Fuff's execution of his kick, and then those two guys chasing. So having both guys or both rabbits, both people chasing for the ball, it's a lot harder to escort. And that example you used um, in the very first half when it was in the middle of the field, like I talked about, um, when you've got the two guys in the back with the pendulum, they've got that space sorted. So, you know, with, with Fuff the Clerk's normal kicks, the two guys are already there, but it was obviously a plan in place to be able to go to that middle, and it's those two guys that are going to be able to come forward, and they're moving in a different direction. And so, it was a plan. It was a plan move for Mel Pepe to get up for that and try trying to get into that space. But I think what Fuff does really, really well, it's his execution of his kick, and then a flow on from that. It's the chase of Nakosi, the outside forward, whether that be Van Mullen or Itzebeth, um, they're getting up for the ball, and making it really, really hard for um, like the likes of Jordy Barrett. And George Bridge, especially in that first half, uh, they really struggled because the the length of the box kick was short enough for them to get up, and it was too far for them to chase. Um, and the escort game as well was a little bit off when you've got the open side runner running at the same time. So, Jipper, what's the tactic there for the All Blacks in order to create the block to give George Bridge and Geordie Barrett the time to not have to worry about those runners that are coming at them? Yeah, well, I think it's always going to be things like that you can control is obviously set piece pressure so that they don't get good um, first game line carry and then obviously um, having a good crack at that first ruck to try and slow it down or disrupt it so that they're not kicking on their terms uh, you're putting some sort of some form of pressure on faf that he has to you know rush the kick that can potentially mean it isn't as accurate as uh, we saw on the weekend so those sorts of areas that um, i suppose the forwards can focus on and controlling and and looking to help out the back three. And then the, the real reality is, is a bit of kick pressure, um, you know, in and around that ruck from your big men and then and then the escorts. Uh, but I, I don't know what it was about Townsville, but it, it did seem to be um, quite hard for them to pick up that ball when it was, um, you know, obviously put quite high. Uh, you know, Geordie Barrett was great. He, he was um, clean in the air, but it's just, I was just surprised. Like there had to be, more to it because George Bridge is such a great exponent of um, the high, high catch, and then and a lot of the times there was pressure, but not um, massive amount. Especially if we look at that try, you, you'd think um, nine times out of ten, ten times out of ten that George Bridge would take that. So there's things that they can control, but I, I do go back to I don't think we'll see those errors um, under the high ball. Uh, like we saw this week again. So you Ian Foster, Bryn, do you make changes or do you go to your team and say, this is how we've got to change as a group and we'll carry on with the same team? Oh, it's tough because, well, it's tough. You've also got guys that have missed out and probably played really well and probably warranted of selection. I think of Sebi Reese, for example, you know, he's played really, really well in the test matches that he has. And look, even when he plays for the Crusaders as well, he's great eerily as well. So look, I think the reason why they did pick Jordy, um, George and Will, they talked around it a little bit taller and with that height difference and knowing that that was going to come. But um, look, I don't think George is going to make that mistake again. Uh, Jipper brought up a pretty good point around, look, it's uncharacteristic for him to be able to drop balls like that, especially the, the first try. Like, that's not going to happen again. That's just a nine times out of ten, George takes that, calls a mark and then kicks it out. So, And a couple of times as well, probably got just his alignment wrong and been able to go up for the ball. And look, I think he'll be on that turtle a lot this week trying to justify a few things but at the same time you've got to give guys opportunities with Sevu you know it was probably a 50 50 um, whether it be George or Sevu playing on the weekend so um, they could change it there but look, I, I, I don't really know because I think it's a real 50 50 call because look Sevu's played really well George got the opportunity would probably like to rectify a few things but whether he's going to get given that opportunity due to his performance on the weekend um, you just gonna have to wait and see when Fozzie and the coaches um, decide after that 
that might be coming back into the selection mix, uh, you know, Dalton um, and Anton Leonard Brown. Uh, so there will be some um, tough decisions, I suppose, as there, as there have been every test. Luke Jacobson having to pull out late. Um, you know, he might come back in for an opportunity to see how he goes against the Springboks. Um, and, and, you know, Ethan Blackett has just made every post a winner. Every time he's been on that field, he has just been exceptional. So he's right in the mix to even retain his spot, really, um, for, for the effort that he did. You know, if you look about, uh, you know, celebrating that the, the magnificent game-winning kick of Geordie Barrett, you watch who's doing the low chop tackle to allow Quinn Tapia access to that mm. ball to get the turnover. It's Ethan Blackett, right? he's just a man possessed, uh, big engine, big body, and uh, doing everything. Uh, he can to remain in that jersey. So uh, there will be some tough selection issues this week, but I do sometimes feel that all black management will go back to saying, yeah, the 23 needs to go back out there and rectify it themselves and, and show, show us what you can do. Um, as I say, the, the test match was still won. There were still uh, a lot of positives, uh, but I, I suppose those error counts, we spoke about the uh, Wallabies uh, weeks prior that, those are things you can control as as players, and if and if you can control them, then the game could be different. Um, there was still plenty um, of flair shown. If you look at Will Jordan's try, um, the ability to line break, I think twenty five defenders beaten. Um, they made great gains up the middle of the field. Um, so look, I, I think it'll be pretty close to the same twenty three. Um, any changes that will be able to be around, you know, maybe because they were originally named last week, like a Jacobson and. Maybe a Leonard Brown and, and Reeks could move to the wing, or um, there's a few mix and match. But I think for the most part, it'll be pretty um, similar. Chipper, we talked about in previous weeks, you know, that this could be the big test for Kito Yuani going up against a box pack doing that. How do you think he came out of that challenge? Yeah, look, I, I think it was um, a good physical uh, battle. Uh, you know, I think everyone's been uh, wrapped with what they've seen of him in the wide channel with ball in hand. Uh, but, you know, all, um, all all back forwards had to roll their sleeves up and, and make sure they tried to dominate. Um, and and I think Akira was was pretty, you know, sound in that area. The one thing I really liked um, seeing in this game is if you watch when Cody Taylor breaks, you watch the two men that react the fastest. One's the try scorer in Jordan. But Akira Yoani, even when you know Jordan's going to score that try, he's sprinting up the backside just in case he doesn't make it. And that's been the big shift that I love seeing in Aki is work off the ball uh, to put himself in a position. He's busy in and around the rut when he makes a tackle. He's back to his feet, his, his big stats, which is back in game stats. So when you go to the ground on a tackle and how fast you get to your feet so that you can do double efforts, you know, he was, he was big in that area. So I think for the most part, he can be happy. There's no doubt that a kid who likes wide channels and, and getting the ball in the hand. So he'll be looking to do a little bit more of that. Um, but, you know, he certainly held his own in a physical battle. Mm. It's a pretty tough call now, especially when you think of Sam Payne coming back towards the end of the year. Obviously, the captain will get his chance, but, geez, that loose forward mix. You know, you mentioned Ethan Blackadder, Dalton Papali'i coming back. You know, Luke Jacobson was supposed to play. I, had, I can't remember which one of you made the big call earlier in the year that Ethan Blackadder could be a, um, an open side flanker at test level, but that's appeared to be true. This loose forward battle, um, is this the key time now this weekend for, for Akira and whoever else goes in there, their Bryn, to really make that stand and lock down the spots in the long term, considering how it went at the breakdown on the weekend? Yeah, look, I think so. I think one test match doesn't really define um, what the form that you are in. And we've talked around a lot around Aki's shifts around his, um, we've, we've always known around how his attacking ability out on the edge, and he's done that you know, against the Australians and the Argentinians as well. But... Um, you know, he, he'll, he'll be able to find the learnings. And it's not just him. There's a lot of guys, they talk around the, the improvement that they want to have in their game, not just on defensively in, in that sense, but, you know, they're 23 turnovers. So with the skill execution, they'll be able to try and fix that and marry that up as well. But I think what it is, it has done, it's just given more depth to, to the to the team. You know, we've talked around guys taking the opportunity. Jacobson's taken his opportunity. Aki's played well in test matches. Um, and Ethan Blackadder, you know, he's played six. He can play six, seven or eight, you know, and he's played, you know, played, came in late on the weekend and, and played really well. So I think, you know, we talk around Aki, he'll, he'll get another opportunity. And I, I reckon he'll make the learnings around what he wanted to do in that test match to be a little bit better. But I think, you know, 
first and foremost, it's great to have the the selection headaches for the group because there will there might be injuries. There might be injuries in games, and like you said. Blackadder came in with Luke Jacobson coming out, and these guys are making real good shifts and making taking every making every post to winner with playing really really well, and that's all you could ask if you're a coach, giving that guy the confidence to select him and coming in late, and then doing what you need to do for the team. So um, you know we also think around Shannon Frizzell. he's another guy that's back home playing for Tasman, who we said through Super Rugby R2 to on Trans Tasman was in tremendous form. So you know, when you've got guys like that back home, um, it, sh- it shows how how well the loose ball tree at the moment is going, and Sam Kane as well the captain and you know he'll be back in the mix for that India tour so I think we're in a really good stead and just continue to keep building that depth for um you know a couple of years time when the 2023 World Cup goes on in France I don't think um anyone in that loose sport trio if you have a good performance one week will ever feel like it's it's their jersey or um they've got a right to that selection because of that competition and I don't think that's ever the case in the All Black um, jersey, but more so in that that loose forward trio. So you, you know your only currency is your last performance, uh, and and every week is massive in that sense. And and this is the same for this week, massive week this week, but it doesn't guarantee you uh, selection for the next week or for the next six months or anything like that, because there's so so much versatility and so many guys offering up so much. You know, you you said about us talking about Ethan Blackadder being able to play open side at all back level because I think you know his best performance for the Crusaders this year was against the Reds when he played open side and, and it, no one had sort of seen him there before. Well, I certainly had him um, and, and I, I was seriously impressed and he just backed that up again. Um, and and I, I don't think, you know, from all black forward standard in terms of the breakdown and, and making those shifts, I, I think they'll all be looking at themselves and, and just thinking they just weren't nailing their own individual roles and maybe distracted about thinking about someone else's role rather than their own. Um, and, and they'll tighten that up and get that focus real zeroed in on themselves for the benefit of the team plans and, and game plans. And, and I think we'll see a different beast uh, come this Saturday. Mm. Mm. You mentioned the lineouts before. Um, scrums and lineouts were both a bit difficult. Is it an easy fix for them? I mean, were you surprised by the difficulties? I, I, look, I, I think it's an easy fix, but never surprised when you play the Springboks. They're a hard team to set piece against. It's, it's their, it's their, I suppose, bread and butter. They love it. Um, but as I said, you know, seventeen wins out of twenty-one. There were four. Losses, I suppose what they'll be looking at is those four losses were in key attacking field position where um, the Springboks chance their arm to get up and uh, challenge for, for possession. So it's just coming up with alternatives. And, and you would have seen a number of times after they lost one, the next line out, they almost got there so quick and went, went fast before the Springboks could get set. And I think that's the key. So then obviously when they're coming to penalties, coming up with a plan or a manipulation in the line out where they can uh, know or guarantee they can win the ball, but not always, um, I suppose, you know, if, if the Springboks give you the front, uh, if you if you look at that driving more, Ethan uh, wins it at the at the front, but it gives the Springboks that angle um, to push them towards the sideline, which is the dream angle, really, when you're defending a all, is if they win at the front, you can just sort of hoover it uh, uh, on an angle towards the sideline, and, and the All Blacks obviously shared, they actually did quite well to share around but then Artie eventually got taken out. But it, it just puts the Springboks right in the race when you win at the front there. So coming up with variations, and, and I, I wouldn't mind seeing some of Brad Moore's stuff, you know, in and around Bryn that you, know, that you guys had uh, when he was coaching mm-hmm. the Crusaders. I think, you know, maybe not going to the driving more. Um, they've shown that they want to take them on there, and that's fine. But coming up with some special plays that I, I yeah. think could catch them off guard because they're so fixated on that driving more area. Yeah, I thought I thought that as well, Jip. I thought you know possibly having the kind of you know you send the halfback and the winger or the the halfback down the blind side, and then you've got the hooker coming out with this seven giving it back to the hooker. Those kind of transition plays to be able to to get them thinking because I think you are right, Jip. They they nullified it really really well with um, you know they all did it. I won't go into too much of the around the detail. It seemed they all had the similar direction, especially when they gave them the front could share that towards the sideline and use that sideline to their friends. So I think, you know, a possibility, whether it just be a quick, you know, the set the Australians have done it really well in the past couple of weeks around getting it out, having the seven take the bunter off and getting into that transition with whether that be, it's been with Karevi or Korobeti, 
getting into that transition, being able to ask different questions because I, I think you know they might continue to keep driving at that, but I think just having a bit of variation around getting them thinking. If it's not going to be a drive, oh, they're going to go in that transition area, or it could just be over the throw, a tempo straight quickly, a real quick throw going into that transition, whether it be the 12 straight over the top or the winger, just to get into that um, transition zone because yeah, they nullified it really well and that could be a solution for them moving forward to have those little special plays and to get that back of that line out, start getting them to think around, is it going to be a drive or we're going to be able to, or do, or do we have to hold off because there might be a bit of animation around that transition, whether that be with a winger or a hooker coming out of a little special play that Brad Moore has had at the Crusaders in the past. The transition zone, Bryn, that's going from the set piece into the attack and the bit that happens in between? Yeah, so if, the, if you just have an example, so the hooker, usually at the, he's at the back of the line-out with the last player, it's usually the hooker. Sometimes it can be a seven or a nine, but it's that guy who's at the back of the line-out and then the first defender in the, in, the, in the back line that's out at 10, which is usually a seven or a 10 possibly, it's usually a seven. So that transition zone is called, you know, between the two and the seven, and there's a bit of, a bit of space, because obviously the seven, the first defender, is back 10 metres. So that's what we're talking around, just being able to get them to ask questions and really get that two and seven and in that defensive phase to get them to start thinking around, is it going to be a drive? Is it going to be an over the top with the 12 coming into that space or a winger coming in or a special play that you've seen with the Crusaders or most New Zealand teams actually sending the seven, sending the nine or a winger down the blind side to hold that front and then you come around the back of that transition with a hooker or a, or a winger in that kind of space asking questions and going through that transition to get over the advantage line like the Australians have with Karevi in the Argentinian series the last couple of test matches. And I think if they start doing that early, then they can go back to their driving more later because it's, if you've started the, the spring box to think defensively, oh, okay, we've got to be worried about the transition zone. Oh, we've got to be worried about that overthrow. So they're a little bit slow to hitting the mall to stop it. Whereas I think in those early parts of either half, that they, as in the spring box defensively, are going to be loaded up, ready to smack a mall. Uh, and that might be the opportunity to manipulate into those transition zone. And then when they start thinking about that, then you can go to your driving ball and, and try and do everything on your terms to put yourself in the best position to execute and, and get points. Hmm. So is David Harvili kind of the victim of Samu Karevi's success, do you think? Because they came at him hard. I think I think that probably he's a victim of his own success. Um, I, I, I think... I think it was a much better display defensively. I know their stats say 77, but they just seemed a lot more connected, a lot more, um, I suppose, working in threes, whereas, you know, you've got the middle guy that's on the main ball carry and the guy inside and outside of him, and, and they created a secure nature like that. And, and I think they'd been broken so much through Samu weeks previous that, yeah, that might have sharpened their focus. But, you know, Davey's been so effective of, you know, getting through between half gaps and getting an offload or just carrying strong and busting through up the other side and scoring tries. So I just think he was he, they were aware of his skill set and how well he'd been playing. And if he could have if, if, if he could have got a half break and link with Rico, I think that would have been a big concern for them. Uh, so they were thinking, if we can just shut him down, it doesn't get to a Rico, it doesn't get to a Will Jordan or Geordie Barrett out wide, uh, it almost stops it uh, dead where it is. Um, so you, you'll see, um, I'm, I'm no doubt, that they'll make adjustments around, I suppose, their foot speed or depth to be able to create space on, the, on that edge going forward. Bryn, do you see, considering what you said earlier about Jacques Nienaba saying, well, we just want to carry on the same way, and see Khaleesi post-match saying, yeah, we're happy with that tactic, that after three straight losses, that's just a public front from the Springboks? Do you think there might be some questioning that they shouldn't lose four in a row and maybe some things will slightly mix up for this test match? I, personally, I don't think so. I think just with the messaging, that with how, when they've been saying it, they've just been pretty adamant around they're playing, they're going to play this way. And I think I possibly thought last week when they lost, the, well, a couple of weeks ago, they lost to the Wallabies. The post-match interview was really interesting for me because they talked around that they needed to go back, look at the review and look at everything to see if they, they needed to change because they just had lost two test matches uh, to the Wallabies and they were questioning around what they were doing. Um, so, but, but then they came out and they played exactly how the way which they must have feel, they feel like is their DNA. So they would have gone away from that review and said, look, all right, 
yep, we've lost two test matches, but what's our identity? What's going to give us the best opportunity to beat the All Blacks with the next two test matches? And they, it was evident on the weekend. You know, they went back to the the thirty eight kicks, been able to put this the under pressure due to the contestable kicks and winning that field position position uh, battle, and then you know trying to get points through that way. So look, I don't think it's gonna it's gonna change a lot. I think what we have talked around is that. When they do get into that 22 meter zone, they've just got to ask questions of the All Blacks. Yes, they might get a penalty here and there just through ill discipline, but I think you've just got to ask questions of the All Blacks when they are in that zone because they have such strength in their physical physical players as they do have. And when they are playing around the corner with Etzebeth and Van, Van Mulen and those big ball carriers around the corner, it's going to ask questions of the All Blacks. And like I said before, if it's that kind of 7 to 10 phases that they're going to defend, it's going to tire them out, and at least it's going to zap energy from the All Blacks. But, you know, if they go one phase and they're inside the 22, and yes, I can see the reasoning behind why they might want to put a contestable kick in for a 50-50, but if they don't get that right, then it just all that pressure to get down there and all that time that they've had to get down there, it's just wasted. So I think moving forward, possibly in that 22-metre zone or 30-metre zone, they are, when they are attacking in the All Blacks' half, I think that's where the questions they might need to be asking around, all right, we just need a exert a little bit more pressure here, play on top of them, and if the kick opportunity is there, they'll take it like they always do. But I think they just need to ask a few more questions with phases and being able to build more pressure with the All Blacks and ask them a little bit more questions and zap them defensively. Okay, should we move on to the next game? Um, I think we've got into the high balls and <laughs> and the, the ways that the All Blacks and the, uh, the Springboks went pretty thoroughly there. Um, the Wallabies versus the Pumas. Uh, what did you make of that victory, Chipper? Oh, look, I, I think it was um, a confident side, um, have found a, a, found their mojo, have found a, a game plan that works for them. Again, a real low turnover count, high possession, high territory, um, risk-free footy. And, and that, they're winning collisions. That's allowing them to make better decisions and attack. And defensively tackling at 90%, um, you know, any, if there's a body... They're going round the legs, looking to access that breakdown pressure and, and get some turnovers in and around there. Uh, probably didn't have as much impact as I'd like around those breakdown turnovers, uh, but always tough against the RG boys. But I think it's they're, they're, I think the best exponent of it is, is the work off the ball of Cotton Betty and Callaway. Uh, if, you, if you look at Reese Hodges' first try where he just busts through, it's the extra body of Cotton Betty, the blindside wing, that comes all the way around and pops up on his outside. And if you remember Icky Tail's second try last week that we spoke about in depth with Karevi's down line and then uh, Cotton Betty getting through and giving the offload um, uh, to, to Icky Tail to get that try, the work that they're doing off the ball to take themselves from their blind wing spot to pop up on the open to be that extra attacker that attracts defence attention and then it's exactly the same. Cotton Betty popped outside Reese Hodge. Two Argentinian players went onto him. And then it made a passive tackle for the inside Argentinian defender on Hodge. Hodge is a big body. He's just like a Geordie Barrett. It's all too easy for him. But it's those sorts of plays. I think, you know, Callaway scored one late in the game, doing the same with an inside ball from James O'Connor. So it reminds me a hell of a lot, to be honest, of the 2012-13 Chiefs. And they're wingers were really hard working in the kick chase really hard working off the ball to provide maybe a bit of a threat in and around the ruck off nine or popping up as an extra attacker on the open side and that's the hardest thing defensively is you're looking up and you're saying i'm on reese i'm on reese and then out of nowhere cotton betty pops up and it makes you second guess and hesitate and because he's such a threat they pushed off to him and, and, you know, that's what I mean by the Aussies are making great decisions because they're, you know, buying time for themselves by winning those collisions. Hodge has ball in two hands and it's an easy show and go. But it's been implemented over the other weeks. You could hear them saying just before Karevi's try, patience, patience. So they're a real well-disciplined side. They want to hold mm. on to that ball. They want to recycle it. They will not give you anything. If you want to get points, you're going to have to earn them. And, that, and that's what I mm. think, you know, you're starting to see. And I think they're starting to believe in the way they're playing and the game plan they've got, and they're starting to really enjoy playing. So, Bryn, Marika Kotoembete, he is out for a little while before rejoining them on the Northern Tour. James O'Connor is coming, well, is back in the side now. How do you reshuffle this Wallaby backline considering those two parts? 
Oh, I think it's it's great depth in, in Australia. And I think, look, you've even got a guy like Jordan Bataille, who's, who's been on the bench the last, you know, four or five test matches. So he's probably itching for an opportunity to to take that spot, you know, whether they change away Callaway, put him on the left wing and put Jordan Pataya on the right the right wing moving forward. That's what, one way they can go. And then you've got James O'Connor, who I thought played really well and had a great injection. You know, that try that he had with um, Callaway with that, what was it, that, that, that was in the 69th minute, um, roving around, you know, I thought the bench as well from Australia was really, really well with, with McDermott, Swain, even Simon, those boys coming on and really asking questions. And I thought it led into, you know, uh, O'Connor to be able to play on front and making good decisions and with his, with his attacking game because he really did attack the line in that, you know, 22 minutes that he did come on and ask really good questions at that time. So, you know, whether they want to see him as a 10 behind Quaid or you chuck him back at 15, and I know Reese Hodges at 15, on the weekend, but we've talked about that dual pivot and especially with his communication skills, being a 10 the last couple, you know, in that kind of Reds campaign, playing 10 in, in, in different eyes and having that 10-15 combination with Quaid and James O'Connor, you know, it could be something they have, want to have moving forward with the likes of putting Pataille on the wing or Hodges, a utility back for them at the moment. So um, they've got enough there to be able to to be able to cater towards um, Corabetti, who I think, again, has been fantastic and has his ability off the ball, like Jip talks around, it asks questions of the defence, and it's really, it comes back to his work rate. A lot of the time you see him covering his covering defensive defensively. There was one show um, phase they showed in, in the game is that he went from one sideline all the way to the other sideline, didn't make the tackle, but then counter rucked that ruck and made the ball available for the Australians. So, you know, his, his work rate is immense and something that's really um, ingrained into them. In, I think David Rennie was perfect around that. You look around that 2012 and 2013 Chiefs chip, you had the likes of Tikita Tuma, who would just be uh, very similar to Corabetti, not in stature around his physicality, but the work rate off the ball and giving guys like Callaway and Hodge with that first try the opportunities to be able to, to score points. So it will be interesting to see how they do go. You've also got Tom Banks, who's played um, good footy when he's come on or played. So um, they've got enough there. And I think the greatest thing about the Australians at the moment is they've got belief. And... You look at that 2012 and 2013 Chiefs, it didn't take long for Rennie to be able to really get some confidence with those boys. And once you have it, um, you know, it's three consecutive wins for the Australians and you know, they've got another test match on the weekend and they've got the India Tour to look forward to. But, you know, I think, you know, the confidence is the best thing about a really good team. And so um, it's been great work. They've made massive solutions around how they played the All Blacks, implemented a lot of things that they wanted to get right, which they didn't get right. And they've implemented it really well against the South Africans and um, the Argentinians on the weekend. And Chipper, when you look at this Wallabies side, considering what's just been said there, and going off to the Northern Tour, the experience they've got would make you think that they should probably be able to carry this on when they're overseas. Oh, 100%. I, I, I think um, they've got depth and position. They've got uh, a next guy up mentality, uh, which is no surprise. So I, I don't see their form dipping because I think the biggest challenge they've had they potentially might have overcome is their actual belief in themselves and what they're capable of. And we said if they could get their errors out of their game, they'd be in fixtures because of the style they play and, and um, not giving opposition opportunity. And that's what they're doing at the moment, 60% possession, 60% on territory, and, and you know a low turnover count and a low penalty count. It just starves. Uh, the opposition of any opportunity to break you down and more opportunity for you to do so. We spoke about, you know, maybe the Springboks running a little bit more to make the All Blacks tackle a few more times. Well, you know, the, the Argies tackled, you know, nearly double the amount that the Wallabies had to. And that, you know, they, they sort of came back into that game around the 55-minute mark and then there was the yellow card to, to Crema. But, you know, the damage had been done with how much defence they have to had to do. Uh, but I still think the only one thing they'd be looking at is that I thought they made some really good headway in their line-out D, but went away from it on the weekend a couple of times being pinged further out and obviously once uh, finding themselves over their try line. So uh, still a work on area there for them uh, to be consistent in that. But outside of that, it's it's pretty clean going and, and it doesn't really change when the subs came on as well, which also shows you that systems and, and the standards are, are spread across the group. And again, I'm not surprised by that with who they've got in charge. So I have no doubt that those standards and expectations will be, um, you know, driven to flow on into the end of your tour. I think one thing they 
that they have got right previously. You know, we talked around the balance of play that they have. They played a little bit too much when they played against the All Blacks, and so you know they had the ball for a lot of a lot of times. And even though that on the weekend they had majority of territory and position, but they're making much better decisions around when they have the ball and when they don't. So we've consistently talked around when they we've talked around their phase play shape, you know, how much better they've gotten the Rovers. We talked around the example with Corabetti floating around Hodge for that first try, and Callaway's second try, how they float in and around the team for the first receiver. But the decision making that they are making, and they're not putting themselves under pressure due to holding on to the ball too long. So I think going to the Northern Hemisphere, where they will probably play similar styles to the South Africans with their kick, with their with their contestable kicking game, and being able to win the field position battle. They've got a good understanding around the learnings around when they did play South Africa. That's probably what they might get in in the Northern Hemisphere or possibly Wales. You know, they with Wayne Pivak, they want to play a little bit more. So taking the learnings that they did with the running rugby with the All Blacks and being able to get a good game understanding of when we do play, when we don't play, which has probably been a massive um, massive positive for the All Blacks. Sorry, not for the All Blacks, the Wallabies in the last probably two, three test matches, taking the learnings from the All Black tests and then implementing that for the South Africans and then also implementing... Um, attack with the kicking game against the Argentinians in their last test match as well. Let me throw a hypothetical at you then, Bryn. Um, if they were to play the All Blacks again now, how much different would that series look? Do you think there'd be a chance that the Wallabies pick up a win now? I think I think it would be. I think they'd, they'd ask a lot more questions because they've talk, taken the solutions around what we've just talked about. And so, you know, the ability of the click attack from the All Blacks has just always been a great weapon, and the click attack is off turnover ball, whether that be off a long phase count. You know, consistently, you know, the Wallabies had a lot of time with they had high phase counts, how high phase high phase counts, and they did a lot of intercepts in those first two test matches. But the solutions that they've made around their phase play attack, around having their structure, their set structure on the edge, um, would be perfect for the All Blacks because it asks them questions and it takes away that bridge pass and putting them under themselves under pressure where they're more, more so it's a 14 point try because they've held on for the ball for so long and they're giving the All Blacks an opportunity to, to be able to take it away and so and then I think also their attack their attack as well with their, their line out you know they've got a lot of variety at the moment whether they're playing specials around the transition with Kirivi again some really good pay off that and then we talk around Tate McDermott on those first two test matches even Nick White as well their ability to play on top of teams and then be able to Use that go around the heart defense, ask questions, but then if they don't find they want to get that there, and there's opportunities to go out wide. The edge play attack, which I just explained, is they're getting a lot more pain, been a lot more patient and clinical when they are in that 22 meter zone. So I think it would be a different encounter. I think, you know, the learnings from what they've had, and if they implemented that into the All Blacks, I think, you know, it'd be a much more closer encounter and they wouldn't have um, as many blowout scores that they did due to their own mistakes, to be honest. They weren't as clinical as enough on those first two test matches then. They're a lot more clinical now and taking the opportunities and getting points in those last three test matches. I just think um, as well as that, it's been their defence. Uh, they're not running out of their system as much against the All Blacks. They created opportunities because they're trying to solve issues in ones and twos rather than as a team. You know, tackling at 90% on the weekend, they're at 90 on the week before, and they're all working for each other inside and out. And it's, it's like a gold Aussie wall at the moment. And that's, that's a big factor in their success as well. Uh, yep, they're making less errors and, and giving themselves opportunity on attack, but they're stopping teams from scoring points, which is probably more important at this level than, than scoring them yourself. Hmm. Um, you mentioned, Bryn, the halfbacks, both Tate McDermott and Nick White and their contribution. Probably a few weeks ago, uh, we would have thought that there's no way that Tate McDermott wouldn't be the top guy who was looking a million dollars. Nick White now appears to maybe be their top guy. How do you think that that's fleshing out? Do you think that it is Nick White? Well, I think it wasn't by choice. I think Tate McDermott at the time had a little bit of a calf injury and it could, it could be still a little bit of an issue. Um, he even saw, even saw it strapped on the weekend. So, you know, through Tate's, Tate's injury and probably a little bit tightness around the calf, it gave Nick White an opportunity. And you talk around opportunities with the All Blacks, the guys coming in and making real big, big statements and having great games due to the opportunity they're getting. And look, we know what we're going to get with Nick White, but you've, all, you've still got to go on the field and play well and consistently play well and you do get that with Nick White he's he's an experienced campaigner um, has a great kicking game which I think will be great moving forward in the northern hemisphere um, having his kicking game is, is really good and that's not to say Tate isn't a great kicker but you know Nick White it's a real good strength of his and then you know I even look at Tate McDermott on the weekend when he came on you know the likes of him um, O'Connor you know Swain and Samu he can come on in that to their last 20 minutes and really impose himself when defense is real tired so 
you know, Tate McDermott can do that coming off the bench, and then so can Nick White. So they're in a real great position, very similar to the, the All Blacks. You know, we talked around Brad Webber and TJ Pedernada, who we thought should start. So you could go either way with those two, and TJ's obviously got the front running in that department at the moment, but, you know, it's not much between those two. And, you know, Tate's probably going to get another opportunity moving forward, but I think you can't lose with both of them because both of them play well starting, and then when they both come off the bench, they're doing the same role that they should do, really um, giving themselves and their team great opportunities due to the impact of them and their injection coming on when they are coming off the bench. And then there's Curtly Beal, Jipper. There's a chance that if the get all rule, which um, from my memory is 70 plus tests allows an overseas player to continue to play for the Wallabies, is going to slightly be loosened. And they could have Curtly Beal as well. That's the three amigos all back in that side as older, smarter blokes. It, <laughs> it's dangerous. Well, yeah. I mean, the redemption story, I suppose, of Quaid and, and James and, and, you know, potentially Curtly coming back. Uh, quality player playing extremely well over in France. So uh, he would add to their depth stop, but also bring a lot of, um, I suppose, experience from over the years to uh, spread throughout the group. And, and I think uh, they're finding the benefit of that, of having guys like Quaid and James back in these environments to do that. And he would only add and enhance that. And, and the fact that he's over there, um, you know, and has the ability to join them uh, will be will be exciting for him, but also exciting for them to have someone of his skill set um, and ex- expertise, because uh, you know I don't know how mu- how much uh, French footy is being watched, but he's um, you know he's ma- he seems to be a, by all accounts making every post a winner. Man's the other one um, looking to return this weekend. Jibber, what does he bring to that Wallabies mix? Oh, look, I've watched a bit of him in the Japanese top league, and he's just. He's sort of like a Dalton Papali, you know, like I, I think he could be like a six, seven or eight, um, you know, maybe in that poke up mold when Hooper was in poke up were going when they made the World Cup final. Uh, he could go at eight, he could go at six, he could go at seven. He's a great exponent uh, over the ball at the breakdown. So he, he definitely adds to their uh, depth and ability there to get you know, breakdown turnovers. He's a great link man. He's got a huge engine. He'll always be in support play um, up, up you know, defensively as well, bringing that line speed pressure. And, and he's just a physical big body. But like I mean with Dalton, like they don't have a lot of respect for themselves. They just chuck themselves into everything and look to win every collision. So he, he he's a big piece to the puzzle, I believe, in, in terms of their loose forward makeup. Mm. Now, this time last year, we were talking about Argentina's resurgence, not Australia's resurgence. They'd put in the hard yards, they'd gone to Australia, they'd stayed there when South Africa wouldn't come and play in the rugby championship. They picked up that win against the All Blacks, which was so famous. This year, we're not talking about them as much. They're not the story. To the point where there was a captain's call on Friday where the three players from the Wallabies, the All Blacks and the Springboks, the captains, all got together for a photo shoot with a trophy and... The Argentines weren't given the call. Uh, Mario Ledesma is pissed off, as you could imagine, about that, that they're being overlooked. Bryn, do you feel that the Argentinians have got a fair point here, that really they're kind of being left to the side? Oh, I think if that's the, that's the example we're using and that, you know, that communication was cut between the Argentinians not knowing that that was happening, then, oh, you know, you could probably, could, you definitely could agree with with that um, decision and how they could feel the frustration to do that. But, you know, I think, you know, I actually don't know, you know, the story behind it, but I can't imagine it was done on purpose, whether there's just been a fall through around the communications to getting it to them, then, um, you know, it's not it's not great for that happening. But, um, you know, the Argentinians have, have gone through, uh, they have gone through a lot, a lot to be here and, you know, it's not an, not an excuse for them and, um, you know, but being able to not play consistent rugby and a lot of their guys, you know, not being uh, playing with the hug ideas, you know, for the last, you know, couple for the last year, it's really tough for them. And yes, they are playing overseas, but you're know, talking about preparation time and, you know, not getting that right. And to be honest, they've been their own worst enemies as well. Discipline's been, been massive with them and not being able to get their flow of their game on the weekend as well. You know, Crema, you know, got Sinbin and had, had two costly penalties due to, his ill discipline, you know, they're giving away a lot of penalties. You look at the All Blacks when they played the All Blacks, consistently high number counts of penalties. And so, you know, when you consistently keep 
given that ill discipline and giving good teams, whether they be you know South Africa, Australia, or New Zealand, you're going to get on the front on the back foot due to those opportunities that you're giving to those teams. And so um, it's, that's probably the biggest issue that I've seen with them at the moment, just the ill discipline and not being able to you know, sustain pressure due to the uh, the decision making around how many penalties they're giving away. So. Um, but to come back to your point, Ross, around that story, you know, um, it's not great. And hopefully, you know, there was just a, um, a communication area around getting that out because um, you could feel, you know, all three teams are there by, by the Argentines. So um, hopefully it was just a communication area. But, you know, talking about rugby, they've probably been their own worst enemy just due to their ill discipline and not uh, really playing the Argentinian rugby that we do know when they do play. Um, you know, they're, they're hard to stop, but just haven't had many opportunities due to that. Jibba, do you think they're far off where they were last year? Well, look, I think Bryn probably touched on a key point there, and, and I'm going to go back to old mate Ben Darwin and the cohesion factor um, of the Hagawares and, and the fact that you know they were running hot together as that group, and then that filtered through to when they played together, um, obviously, for Argentina, and, and, and they just were running a hot wave of form um, across a number of players but it was a group that had played a lot of footy together in that space of time and and that's what it looked like whereas on this occasion now they've gone back to you know separate clubs and, and it looks like a team that's sort of trying to catch up I don't think they've lost their skill set or ability but they just don't have that cohesion of knowing um, you know what their mates going to do inside and outside of them and that's sort of causing a few errors but also not allowing them to get that flow of play of their offload game, their kicking, attacking, kicking game, and, and playing that off the cuff footy that you know we've spoken about before. That is, you sort of like, where did that come from? But for them, it's so instinctive and natural uh, when they know each other, uh, others' games inside and out. And I think that's probably where they're, they're you know not quite hitting the mark because I still think their set pieces sound and you know they're rolling maulers, but defensively and in phase play attack, they're just not um, you know, cohesive, as I mentioned before with, with our old mate Ben Darwin. It's difficult, isn't it? Because when you look at the way that they've got rugby set up in their country, you used to have one professional team and then completely amateur underneath the Juarez. They're at a point now where basically there are no professional players in their country, in their country, you know, they can't do the camps that the All Blacks do mid Super Rugby. They can't have that connection that the Wallabies get with their players. Um, they are at such a big disadvantage now, aren't they, Bryn? Yeah, they are. And I think we talked around the Australians and the domestic competition as you know a work on for them moving forward. We talked around the ghetto law and you know the positive and the negative of having that. You know. The most important thing for Australia is to be able to have that, that depth in schools and, you know, a Bunnings Cup kind of set up to be able to make them better. But, you know, like, the Argentinians are just at a, a complete uh, massive disadvantage due to the fact that Haguaris have left the competition because, you know, they played in that final in 2019 and the majority of that um, Haguaris team was in the was in the Argentinian team. So, you know, that cohesiveness and being able to play together consistently on the road, been able to build friendships, camaraderie, um, detail, and you talk around cohesiveness, you know, when you're together for a, for a long period of time, for a four or five month season, and then it flows on to the Argentinian season, it's those kind of, um, those times that you get in training to be able to iron things out, have conversations outside of rugby, looking at the same thing with the individual groups that you need to, whether you're an inside back pairing or you're uh, the loose forwards or the tighties together, that time they miss out, and so they do have to play a lot of catch up, so... It is unfortunate they haven't been to be able to be a part of that Super Rugby competition because, you know, you look at the Sunwolves and they probably, not going to say warranted leaving the competition, but just due to the fact that they weren't delivering on the field. But you look at the Hagwaris and the competition that they were putting in, you know, playing in a Super Rugby final for against a, a, t a tough competition and playing us in that 2019 campaign and, and giving it a good go. It was just a flow on for them to be able to make it, that transition a lot easier into that international international round and that's when you saw better performances of them you know beating the all blacks and being able to play a lot better so you know i'd like to think hopefully the powers that be in the Argent argentine rugby union um association can try and sort out some kind of plan to get their players together whether that's a two-week camp that they come to can come together and talk around their clubs to be able to let them get released to come and to come and play because look they are at a disadvantage you know the wallabies south africans probably the south africans had a, a bit of trouble before they're not playing a lot of test match footy but um, definitely the Australian and New Zealand are at, a, at an advantage being able to have those camps play Super Rugby teams together and being able to get that cohesiveness that um, Ben Darwin loved to use as well 
So, Jipper, they've had a few weeks together now. Cohesiveness, will there be enough to maybe knock off the Wallabies this weekend? Oh, mate, I think there's two sides on the field, isn't there? They, they, they are definitely improving, I think. Um, but the Wallabies are going from strength to strength. Uh, they're certainly not out of the running. Like There was sort of missing those penalties that we're not used to seeing. Argy's miss could have created some scoreboard pressure, which maybe put the Wallabies in a position to chance their arm and could have led to a few errors. I know that's not how it played out, but if they're going to go for threes and, and not for the corner, then they need to be nailing those so that they can tip their scoreboard over, but also creep up next to the Wallabies or even past them to put them under pressure. That puts them in a position they haven't been in for a few weeks. And, and then I think you'll see, um, you know, that's when the RG boys will come into their own because they've got nothing to lose. And when they're in that nothing to lose mindset, it's, it's all on for young and old. Um, and, and really enjoyable to watch. So I, I don't think you can ever write um, them off, but they're going to have to be a lot more accurate in key parts of their game. Uh, you know, I've spoken about that obviously taking their points when off of offer, but, you know, being accurate around their breakdown and, and their defence, um, and, and Bryn sort of touched on it as their discipline, not giving um, the Wallabies easy opportunities into their half to you know, put them on their uh, defensive line and have to make 20-odd tackles before they eventually go over. I think it is, this could be seen as, as a banana skin game as well for the Wallabies. And, look, they've had three test match wins in a row and have some real good form and been able to make um, some massive um, changes in the last couple of test matches. But, you know, they are going overseas and a lot of those players have played a lot of minutes consistently. You look at the likes of, you know, Karibi's come back and played some great footy, but the likes of Ikitao, Michael Hooper as well has played a lot of footy. And so there has been a lot of players that have played a lot of footy. So, you know, you do want to give your squad an opportunity to be able to, to have changes and they could moving forward. They might have a few changes that might come in there. And so... I think it's going to be a good test for the Aussies to see if they can finish off the, the rugby championship in style because they've done so much great work around the learnings and the great results. Two wins against South Africa, uh, a gutsy performance against an Argentinian side where they were given opportunities and you know did enough to be able to win comfortably. But I think moving forward into the British, oh, it's not the British and Irish Lions, the uh, India Tour, I think them getting a win and finish this, this campaign in a four-match test series win um, span, I think it's going to be really important for them. So um, it could be a banana skin game because, you know, there have been moments in the past where they've played really well and then they miss they miss one game and they do lose due to um, just being off a little bit. And I think what Gypsy is really important, do not rest on uh, or be complacent when it comes to an Argentinian team that has nothing to lose. And I can imagine, you know, there'll be posters around um, with how much disrespect they, they've been felt around, you know, that example that you had, Ross, and you know, just not take them for granted because they're a team when they do get it right. Um, it's going to be a tough encounter if the Australians don't see that at 100% mentality-wise coming for this last test match of the Rugby Championship. Okay, and the big match, the All Blacks versus the Springboks, the rematch this weekend after what was such an incredibly close tussle in the end, if not slightly divisive on people's opinions. Chipper, where do you see this one going? Well, look, I still think the All Blacks will win. Um, and namely, I think there'll be an improved performance at the break, breakdown set piece in their handling areas. You know, obviously 10 breakdown turnovers plus 24 handling areas 34 times in an 80-minute game you're giving the ball back to the opposition is going to put you in a position where it's very hard to win test matches, especially against top oppositions, the world champions that are the Springboks. Uh, so I, I think we'll see a, a, a slicker, uh, all Blacks outfit this weekend which will give them the edge uh, and I, I don't think we'll see too much change uh, from the Springboks tactics because if you look at it on the surface it worked for the most part and nearly gave them the ability to win this test match uh, and, and if they can keep up that accuracy with their defence I think they should be looking at the, the concerns they had with the All Blacks breaking them back through the middle after their rush D forced them back inside uh, the, the, the defenders on the inside buttoning off uh, once the ball's gone past them, they'll, they'll be wanting to shore up that. Another close encounter, uh, I said it last week, styles make fights. Both these teams like bringing their uh, best out against each other, and, and by that I mean their best brings out a few errors in each other as well. So uh, it, it'll be another tight contest, but I think the All Blacks will get home in Gold Coast. And Yeah, I think... Yeah, I think, yeah, it'll be another close encounter. But I think, you know, probably the 
the things that the All Blacks are probably going to work on is around you know their turnovers. I don't, we're not going to see 23, 24 turnovers again. I think you know they're going to make the the adjustments when it comes to that to that line speed pressure that the South Africans did bring in. You know whether that's just with a little bit more depth, depth. Um, a few attacking kicks maybe early off lineouts or scrums, uh, or even possibly a cross field kick as well. Um, there were a couple of opportunities um, that there were opportunities to be able to do the cross field kick, and not just off 10 as well. I think if they do give it to that second pivot um, with Davy in behind, you know, Davy's got a great kicking game, and so if that communication is coming in from the wingers or that loose forward out on the edge, and if Bodie isn't going to kick it, the opportunity for David to be able to kick that cross field kick or using his kicking game of attacking kicks because he's done it so well at. Um, at Crusaders level at 15 or at 12. And then I think for the South Africans, a lot won't change with how they do that. I think their discipline is, is something that they need to work on. You know, they've given away five yellow cards in the last three games. So being able to give, you know, the All Blacks opportunities and not just the All Blacks, but the last couple of test matches, having 10 minutes off with 14 players, put yourself under stress to be able to then slow up your game a little bit more. And, um, we, you know, we might see a little bit more of them going down a little bit more, which they, um, as a, as a ploy that they do have. But, you know, the All Blacks will have to be able to adjust to that because I think, look, um, they don't want to be playing at a high tempo. They want to be able to slow the game down to their level to be able to play at a, at a pace that they want it. And scenes that we saw on, on the weekend, you know, the All Blacks weren't, be able, weren't able to get into their game due to the fact that the kick execution from Fuff to Klerk was on. They slowed down the game. The All Blacks couldn't get their game going and it led to their turnovers with, you know, 23 turnovers. So I think they will get a lot better with the All Blacks around their skill execution and probably... Um, j- adjusting to the line speed pressure that the that the South Africans did do on the weekend. Oh, more kicking, <laughs> more, more kicking. Start oh. embracing it. Start embracing it. Start embracing it. Start embracing it. There's so much we can talk about. We're talking about so much with the amount of detail that we're giving to our viewers and understanding of two sides of rugby styles. Make fights, mate. Uh, that's right. Alexander Usyk will say that to you uh, after beating Joshua on the weekend. They do make fights, and I mean, it made it interesting. It made it gripping. It made it all of those things. But please, Jack Nienabu, if you're out there, can you please pass the ball past nine, past ten, possibly twelve? You're in thirteen, and if really at a push, maybe give the ball to my pimpy. Just that's all I ask. Just once. Just once. <laughs> Yeah, we've got a couple more shows to change to change Ross, mate. We've got a couple more shows to change him. Because I'm enjoying it. I'm enjoying the encounter. I'm loving it. <laughs> mate, they, they execute it just as well. Um, they'll, yep. they'll be enjoying it too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know. I know. I know. More of it to come. Well, thank you, everyone, for tuning in again to the Aotearoa Rugby Pod. Thank you to Bryn. Thank you to James. We'll catch you all again next week. Fingers crossed. Some running rugby. Matewa.